everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about the solved case of Sabina Nessa, a young woman from from London who was horrifically attacked and killed one night while she was just on her way to meet a friend. When the police launched their investigation into Sabina's murder, it was ultimately CCTV that would provide the huge breakthrough that they needed and lead them directly to their suspect. And as they started piecing this suspect's movements together on the night that Sabina died, they realized that this incredibly violent crime was premeditated. And when news of Sabina Sabina's murder spread, it sparked nationwide outrage and the demand for change when it came to male violence towards women in the UK. But quickly before we get into the case, please listen carefully to the following. This video is about the murder of a young woman and it involves heavy themes such as violence towards women as well as sexual assault and domestic violence and abuse. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case, we are going back just over two years now to September September of 2021 in Kidbrook, which is an area located in Greenwich in South East London in England. And this is Sabina Nessa. She was a 28 year old woman who lived in Kidbrook. Sabina was born on the 23rd of October 1992 to her parents Adba Rauf and Aziban Nessa. I really hope I pronounced those names correctly. I do apologise if not. And Sabina was one of three children. She had two sisters and their names were Jabina and Sadia. According to sources, Sabina and her family used to live in the county of Bedfordshire in England, that's where Sabina grew up, and she was described by her older sister Jabina as being just such a caring and lovable person who was really funny. Jabina also said that her sister was very bright and intelligent and also just fearless and powerful. Sabina was the kind of person that wasn't afraid of giving her opinion on things. She would always stand up for what she believed in. So she was said to be an incredible role model to her nieces, her sister's kids. Jabina also said that growing up, Sabina was the biggest animal lover going. When they were children, they had a range of different pets from tropical fish to budgies and cats and Sabina loved them. She loved taking care of them. Jabina also described her little sister as being very much a girly girl. She liked makeup and fashion. She loved going shopping. Apparently as an adult, that was something that she enjoyed doing often with her nieces. She loved treating them and taking them shopping. It's clear from what has been said about Sabina that she was very much a family oriented person. Her family meant the absolute world to her as she did to them. And by 28 years old, Sabina Nessa was a school teacher. She graduated from university with a degree in sociology. And following this, she went on to get her teaching certificate and she ended up securing a job teaching a year one class at the Rushy Green Primary School in Lewisham in South East London, which by all accounts she absolutely loved. Sabina seemed to be very passionate about her job. Her sister Jabina said that she really wanted to make a difference to her students' lives and she wanted to have a positive impact on their development because as I said she taught year one, so the kids in her class would have only been like five to six years old. The head teacher of the school where Sabina worked described Sabina as being a very kind and caring teacher who quote was absolutely dedicated to her pupils. There's no doubt that Sabina would have gone so far in her career as a teacher. She had such a bright and promising future ahead of her but tragically the future was something that Sabina would never get to see as in September of 2021 her life was suddenly and brutally cut very short. The date was the 17th of September 2021. It was a Friday, the end of the school week, and so that Friday evening, 28-year-old Sabina Nessa had made plans to go out. She and a friend of hers, a guy friend, had decided to meet up and go for a drink at a bar or a pub in Kidbrook Village. It was called the Depot Pub, and it wasn't too far from where Sabina lived. She lived on Astell Road in Kidbrook, which is probably less than a 10-minute walk away from the Depot Pub. So she got dressed up, she got her herself already 
Lucy, she said goodbye to her roommate and she left her home to go and meet her friend just after 8.30pm that evening. And apparently Sabina was running a little bit late to meet her friend and so she decided to actually take a shortcut. Rather than walking along the normal route along the main road, she chose to walk through a park in Kidbrook, Cater Park, which would have taken I think a good few minutes off of her journey. Now usually Sabina was very cautious about walking through Cater Park, especially at this time of night because obviously it was dark outside and it was secluded and she had expressed before that she always felt a bit anxious walking through the park in the evening as a young woman. So it's not something that she usually would have done but as I said she was running a bit late to meet her friend at the bar and so she clearly just thought screw it let's just walk through the park so that I can get to the bar sooner. However as it would turn out Sabina Nessa would never make it to her destination that night. She never arrived at the pub. It appeared as though at some point along her route she just mysteriously disappeared and it wouldn't be until nearly an entire day later when people realised why. When the truth about Sabina's disappearance came to light. You see the day following this on the afternoon of the 18th of September 2021 the Metropolitan Police received a report that a body had been found. A young woman had been found dead in Cater Park. At approximately 5.30 p.m. that day, a man who was walking his dog through the park stumbled upon a woman. She was lying on the ground. She was kind of covered with grass. Well, she was lying in long grass. And at first, this dog walker actually thought that this woman was sleeping. At first glance, she just looked like she was asleep. And so he actually assumed that she was drunk that she had probably been out drinking the previous night and that she was so intoxicated that she just passed out and fell asleep on the ground in the park. And so he began speaking to her to see if she would wake up, but she didn't. And as this member of the public got closer, he realized that this young woman wasn't sleeping after all, she was actually dead. And so he immediately called 999 and reported this awful discovery to the police. When emergency services arrived at the scene, it was pretty clear immediately that this was no natural death. The injuries that the police could see made it obvious that this poor young woman had been subjected to an incredibly violent attack. She had been badly beaten around the head with some kind of heavy object and it was also clear from how her body had been left that this murder was probably sexually motivated. She had essentially been posed in a sexual way. Her legs had been spread apart, her tights and her underwear had been removed and her skirt or her dress had been pulled up so that the lower half of her body was exposed. The killer demonstrated just a complete lack of respect in how they had left their victim. Although despite her body being left in this way, I believe it was later determined that she hadn't actually been sexually assaulted in a penetrative way. There was no evidence of rape but again as I I said the fact that she had been posed in a sexual way still strongly suggests that this crime was sexually motivated. It was also clear to the police pretty much straight away that this area in the park wasn't actually where this woman was killed due to the fact that there wasn't much blood found at the scene and she had been brutally beaten around the head so if she was attacked in this spot you would have expected to see more blood. So the lack of blood indicated that she was killed elsewhere possibly possibly in a different area in the park and then she was brought to this spot where she would later be found. So the police had a murder inquiry on their hands and of course their number one priority straight away was to identify the victim and notify her family of the tragic news. And actually, thankfully, they were able to do this, identify her very quickly because she had her ID on her. This woman's passport was found in one of her pockets and the name on this passport was Sabina Nessa. 
it was Sabina who had been found murdered in Cater Park. So after Sabina was identified, as I said, the family were informed and Sabina's body was taken for an autopsy, which revealed that not only had she been hit around the head numerous times, 34 times to be exact, she'd been beaten so viciously that her skull was fractured, but she had also been strangled by her attacker. And actually the pathologist was unfortunately unable to determine which of these injuries was her official cause of death. They couldn't figure out whether it was the blunt force trauma injuries that killed her or the strangulation. Of course, as part of their inquiries, the police cornered off the crime scene, the park, and they also began looking extensively into Sabina and her life, trying to determine if there was anyone in her life that would have wanted to do this to her. They spoke at length with her friends and her family, and eventually they were able to put a timeline of events together. They were able to determine what Sabina had been doing on the night that she went missing and was murdered, the 17th of September. Of course, they discovered that that evening she was on her way to meet a guy friend at the depot pub in Kidbrook Village. And so the police had their first person of interest. Sabina was on her way to meet this friend that night. So was he the perpetrator? Was he the one who killed Sabina? So this friend was questioned. According to a documentary that I watched about this case, he was even arrested on suspicion of Sabina's murder. However, it soon became clear to the detectives that he was in fact innocent and so he was let go and the investigation continued. And to be honest, they couldn't really identify anyone else in Sabina's life that would have had a motive for this horrific crime. She was a very, very likeable person. She had no known enemies, so it seemed seemed as though perhaps the man that killed Sabina was a complete stranger to her. So in an effort to identify a suspect, the police turned to CCTV because thankfully there were CCTV cameras both in and around the park. And so they started going through all of the footage from the evening of the 17th of September and they had a huge breakthrough. What they discovered was that the attack on Sabina had actually been caught on camera, something that the killer at the time was clearly completely unaware of. Now, for obvious reasons, the section of CCTV footage which shows the actual attack has never been released to the public, but the police have described what is seen on this part of the footage. So Sabina was caught on CCTV walking through Cater Park on the evening of the 17th as she began her journey to the pub where she was obviously going to meet her friend. And as as she was walking, she was none the wiser that a man, a stranger, was hiding in the park watching her. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, this man was seen approaching Sabina from behind and in his hands he was carrying what looked like some kind of heavy object and when he reached Sabina, he raised this object and began violently beating her with it around the head. He was seen on CCTV hitting Sabina over and over and over again. As I mentioned before, it was later determined that she was hit about 34 times with this weapon. So there was no doubt that this man was trying to kill her, although it's believed that after suffering these injuries, Sabina was just knocked unconscious. She wasn't dead yet. And now that she was knocked out and she obviously couldn't defend herself, the attacker decided to take her elsewhere. He was seen picking Sabina up and walking away with her into the darkness. I think out of view of any CCTV cameras. It's believed that he took her to that area of the park where she was later found by the dog walker and it's thought that it was there where the attacker strangled Sabina and she died as a result of her injuries and as we know he also removed her underwear and he left her in a sexually degrading position. Approximately 10 minutes after the perpetrator was seen carrying Sabina away he is spotted again on CCTV and he actually returns to the spot where the initial attack on Sabina took place and he was seen literally cleaning up the crime scene. He appears to get out some tissues or wet wipes and it looks as though he starts wiping up any areas where he could see blood, Sabina's blood. In particular, he gave this bench at the crime scene a thorough wipe because during the attack, Sabina 
had actually collapsed onto this bench. So obviously quite a lot of her blood would have been on it. So he wiped the blood off of this bench and then he was also seen picking up off the ground the object, the weapon that he had used to beat Sabina with. So this is a killer that is clearly forensically aware and his actions also suggest that this crime may have been premeditated. I mean the fact that he brought a weapon of some kind with him and the fact that he had wipes to clean up the blood. That seems to indicate that this attack was planned to a degree. So as I said before, this CCTV footage really was a groundbreaking piece of evidence. The police literally had the murder or the start of the murder on camera. This was huge. However, the only problem was, although they had this CCTV, they didn't actually have a very clear image of the suspect. Obviously, it was between like half eight and 9 p.m. when the attack took place, so it was dark outside and the footage was a bit grainy. And also, I believe the attacker may have had his hood up, so they couldn't really get a good picture of him, of his face, which was probably going to mean that identifying him through this footage alone would be very difficult. And so, in an effort to maybe get a clearer image of him and also trace his movements both before and after the murder, the police continue checking other CCTV cameras from around the park. They wanted to see if they would be able to spot him both arriving at the crime scene at the park that night and also leaving after the attack. And what they saw on one CCTV camera both before and after the attack was something glimmering. There was a faint light on the camera as if someone was carrying like a reflective object of some kind or wearing like a reflective item. They didn't really know what it was at this point, what exactly this thing that seemed to be reflecting was, but the police wondered if perhaps it was Sabina's killer that was carrying it since this glimmer on the CCTV was seen both before and after the attack near an area of the park where you could both enter and exit, if that makes sense. So if it was the killer, then this kind of showed the police the direction that he came from and the direction that he left in. So they focused their efforts on this specific area and trawled through literally hundreds of hours worth of CCTV footage from around this area to see if they could spot him again. And as a result of this, they were able to obtain footage of an unknown male walking along Pegla Square, I believe shortly after the attack on Sabina took place. And Pegla Square is very close to Cater Park. I think it's literally just opposite. And this man seemed to be behaving pretty suspiciously on this footage. He was wearing these grey jeans or jogging bottoms and this black coat and these black and white trainers. And if you look closely, it looks like he is carrying something, some kind of red object. And he just appears to be quite nervous and anxious on this footage. As he was walking, he looked around, he looked over his shoulder a lot as if he was checking behind him. And he also put his hood up. So the police wondered if perhaps this unknown male was the killer. And they actually released this image of him to the public in the hopes of identifying him faster. In addition to this, I believe the police were also able to trace this man to a vehicle. He returned to a vehicle which I think was also parked in Pegler Square and when they checked the CCTV footage from before the murder they were able to establish that the vehicle, the car, arrived on Pegler Square and it parked up less than an hour before Sabina was killed at around 7.40pm. So this footage put this man and his vehicle very close to the crime scene shortly before the murder occurred and shortly afterwards too. Now unfortunately the CCTV footage of this vehicle on Pegler Square wasn't clear enough to get a good picture of the number plate. However, experts strongly believed that the car looked like a silver Nissan Micra and so they started checking CCTV cameras and ANPR cameras around the area for a silver Nissan Micra in the hopes that they would be able to trace where this male, the suspect, went after the murder. And the police ultimately ruled out over 60 of these types of cars in their investigation, but they were able to trace one particular silver Nissan Micra all the way 
to Eastbourne, a town in East Sussex in England, which is about an hour and a half's drive away from Kidbrook in London. And what the police found very interesting about this silver Nissan Micra in particular was that when they looked further into the driving history of the vehicle, they found that in the last year or so, it had never really driven anywhere outside of the Eastbourne area. The owner only drove it in Eastbourne apart from on the night of Sabina's murder. On that night, for some reason, they drove it all the way to Pegla Square in Kibrook. The car was captured on AMPR cameras driving into Kibrook, again, less than an hour before the attack on Sabina. So they decided to do a little bit of digging. They looked up the number plate and they found that the registered owner of this specific Nissan Micra was 36 year old Kochi Selamaj. So let's talk a little bit more about him. So Kochi Selamaj was born in 1985 in Albania. Although he didn't live in Albania for too long, I don't think. At some point when he was a young child, he and his family relocated to Greece. And from what I can gather, he came from a very normal, hardworking family. I don't believe anyone in his family had a criminal history or anything. Fast forward to 2015, so when Kochi was around 30 years old, he came to the UK illegally. He was transported into the UK via the back of a lorry. And he eventually got married to a woman from from Romania and obviously because she was an EU citizen that meant that he was able to stay in the UK legally on a long-term immigration status because his partner was from the EU. As I mentioned before he lived in Eastbourne in East Sussex, he lived there with his wife and according to sources Kochi worked as a delivery driver or a garage worker in Eastbourne and from an outsider's perspective it would appear as though he lived a pretty average life. He had had no run-ins with the police before. He'd never been convicted of a crime. He just seemed like a normal, hard-working man, I guess. However, what the police would later learn about Kochi Selamaj was that he was actually incredibly abusive towards his wife. He'd been violent towards her on a number of occasions, and he'd even put his hands around her neck before and tried to strangle her. And again, on multiple occasions, this happened. His his wife, her name was Ionella, she never reported this abuse to the police, perhaps she was just too terrified to, but she did ultimately end up leaving Kochi because she knew that she had to get away from him, although she actually had nowhere to go, so I think she was homeless for a period of time, but she did work at a hotel, so I believe they would allow her to stay there sometimes just so that she would have a roof over her head. And speaking of this hotel, so by this point, obviously, because of the Nissan Micra and the CCTV footage of the unknown male on Pegler Square, which seemed to look very much like Kochi Selimar. He was considered a top suspect by the detectives, and so they started looking further into Kochi's movements in the days before Sabina was killed. And what they discovered was that just three days before her murder, on the 14th of September 2021, Kochi Selimar actually booked a stay at a local hotel hotel in Eastbourne. It was called the Grand Hotel. And actually, it's the same hotel where his wife or ex-wife, I'm not entirely sure if they were divorced yet, but it's the hotel where she worked. And on the 14th of September 2021, Kochi booked a room at this hotel for the 17th of September. So in three days time, which seems so strange to the police, the fact that he booked this hotel room, because number one, he literally lived in Eastbourne, less than five minutes away from this hotel. And number two, it was incredibly expensive. The Grand Hotel was one of the most pricey in Eastbourne. It literally cost somewhere between like 300 to 400 pounds per night to stay there. And Kochi Selimaj wasn't rich or anything. He didn't have that much money. So the police were just like, why would he book a night at this very expensive hotel when he lived a couple of minutes down the road from it. Well, it's been theorised that he did this to 
try and impress his ex-wife, possibly to try and win her back. And when the day came, the 17th of September, Kochi headed to the Grand Hotel. He arrived at around 2.30 p.m. He checked in. He apparently got quite annoyed at the hotel receptionist when they asked him to pay for his hotel room in advance. He clearly wanted to pay after his stay, but they were like, no, you have to pay up front. So he got frustrated with them and apparently an argument broke out. Some sources even state that the hotel called the police because Kochi just kept arguing with them about the payment. And also, obviously, the hotel workers knew who he was. They knew that he was Ionella's ex-partner and that he was bad news. He was abusive. So apparently they called the police on him, but no police officers were actually dispatched to the hotel because eventually they settled this dispute and Kochi Selamaj finally agreed to pay up front. I believe shortly after his arrival at the hotel, Kochi asked his wife to meet him in the car park outside. He said that he wanted to speak with her and so she agreed and she went out to talk to him. And apparently during this conversation, Kochi tried to persuade Ionella to have sex with him in the back seat of his car, to which she said no and she walked away. And it's been theorised that this angered Kochi Selamaj. He was so angry that his ex-wife refused to have sex with him and that she clearly wasn't impressed at all by the fact that he had splashed out and booked a room in the expensive hotel where she worked. He was furious and this rage that he found is what may have encouraged him to do what the police now believe he did later that night. Attack and murder an innocent young woman and slowly they were able to to piece together his movements from that evening and they found even more evidence to support their theory that Kochi Selamaj was Sabina Nessa's killer. Not long after his wife turned him down, the police were able to determine that Kochi Selamaj got into his car, his silver Nissan Micra, and he drove towards Brighton and he was just driving along the roads, driving along the streets, it's believed, looking for a girl that he could attack and take his anger towards his wife out on. However, he had no luck in Brighton and so instead he drove to Kidbrook in London. As we discussed earlier, he was seen driving into Kidbrook less than an hour before Sabina Nessa was killed. Once he arrived, police were able to trace him again through CCTV, going into a local Sainsbury's supermarket. This was at around 7.46pm. He purchased three items from this supermarket Supermarket. He brought an energy drink, some chilli powder and also a wooden rolling pin. And what's interesting is when the police watched him on the CCTV in this supermarket, they noticed that he spent a lot of time down the homeware aisle of the supermarket. He was walking up and down it, looking at everything on the shelves until eventually he picked up the rolling pin and he just kind of held it in his hand. He looked like maybe he was feeling the weight of it and as I said, he ultimately decided to buy it along with a drink and some chilli powder. And the police actually believe that he intended to use this rolling pin as a weapon. He was going to use it during his attack on a young woman. Maybe even the chilli powder too. It's been theorised that maybe he intended to chuck some of the chilli powder in his victim's face when he first launched the attack in an attempt to maybe blind them and make it harder for them to fight back because they wouldn't be able to see. However, he ultimately never ended up using either of these items. He didn't use the chilli powder nor the rolling pin and it's believed that the reason for this was because in the boot or the trunk of his Nissan Micra he found what he thought may have been an even better weapon. He found a warning triangle or a traffic triangle that many people keep in their cars just in case they encounter a problem whilst they are driving, in case they break down and they have to put this triangle next to their vehicle to give warning to other cars that they are stationary. They're particularly useful if you break down at night because 
they are reflective. They're normally made using plastic and metal that have a highly reflective surface. And I'm sure many of you would have started to already connect the dots here. If you recall from earlier on in the video, when the police checked CCTV footage from around Cater Park on the night that Sabina was killed, they saw someone walking into and out of the park before and after the attack. And they seem to be carrying some kind of reflective item because it was glinting. Something was giving off a little flash of light as the person was walking. So now the police believed that the reflective item was this red traffic triangle and that the person carrying it was Kochi Selamar. Anyway, it's believed that he opened the boot of this car, he saw this traffic triangle, saw that it had pointy edges, and I imagine it was fairly heavy, and so he decided to use this as a weapon instead of the rolling pin. And with his new weapon in hand, Kochi Selamar headed to Cater Park. And once inside the park, he just waited. He waited in the darkness, he waited for about 22 minutes in total for a young woman to come along on her own that he could attack which to me just highlights how incredibly twisted and sadistic this man was i mean we already know that this crime was premeditated from his actions so far you know driving around brighton looking for a victim first going to the supermarket and picking up items that he could use in the attack his actions in the lead up to the murder make it very very clear what his intentions were that night but the fact that he waited for 22 minutes in the park in almost complete darkness, in complete silence, and not for one of those minutes did he stop and think to himself, what the hell am I doing? I should not be doing this. I should just leave. He had those 22 minutes with just his own thoughts and he still did not, I guess, change his mind. He was clearly still reeling from the argument that he had had with his ex-wife, still furious that she refused to have sex with him and he was still determined to take that anger out on an innocent young woman. And that innocent young woman just happened to be 28 year old Sabina Nessa. And we obviously know what happens next. Once he spotted Sabina, he ran up behind her and he immediately began viciously beating her with what we now know was the red traffic triangle. How terrified Sabina must have been in those moments is just beyond comprehension. And it breaks my heart that she was already a bit nervous and apprehensive about walking through that park at night because of something like this happening to her. A fear that every woman has had when they're walking alone in the evening. She was already terrified of the worst happening and it happened. She must have been just so, so scared and in so much pain. It's unimaginable. Kochi Selamaj was just relentless that night. He just hit Sabina with the triangle over and over again. And when she was unconscious, he obviously carries her to another area in the park where he removed her underwear and he strangled her. As we discussed earlier, he momentarily returned back to the spot in the park where the attack began by the bench and he wiped the bench with wet wipes in an attempt to get rid of any blood or DNA evidence. And he also picked up the murder weapon, the traffic triangle, which I think had broken in some places during the attack. So he picked up the broken pieces and then he just left. I believe he left the park just after 9pm and as we know he was seen on CCTV footage along Pegler Square carrying the traffic triangle and he kept looking behind him. He was obviously very nervous knowing what he had just done but he walked back to his car, he got inside and then he just drove away, drove out of Kidbrook but he didn't go straight home. He didn't drive straight back to Eastbourne because he had some evidence that he needed to dispose of, he decided that he needed to get rid of the murder weapon, the traffic triangle. And so as the police began piecing together his steps that night, they were eventually able to establish through AMPR cameras that he headed to Tunbridge Wells, which is a town in Kent. And he stopped down a quiet country lane in Tunbridge Wells near an area by the River Tees. So the police theorised that he may have disposed 
composed of the traffic triangle in this river and this theory was confirmed when the river was searched and a red traffic triangle was pulled out. The police had found the murder weapon. Nine days after the horrific crime on the 26th of September 2021, 36-year-old Kochi Selamaj was arrested at his home in Eastbourne on suspicion of the murder of Sabina Nessa. And following his arrest, his home was searched. The police were keen to see if they could find any additional evidence linking him to the crime in there. Like, for example, the clothing that he was wearing on the evening that Sabina died. Now, they did discover in his home some grey jeans or jogging bottoms and also a top which looked identical to the clothes that he was seen wearing on the CCTV footage that night. However, Kochi had washed these items of clothing. They'd been in the washing machine, so chances are they're probably not going to have any luck finding any forensic evidence on those that could have connected him to the crime. But luckily, he hadn't washed his trainers. In his home, the police found the black and white trainers that he was again seen wearing on the night of the attack. And when examined further, traces of blood were found on these trainers and this blood came back as a match to Sabina Nessa. They also searched his car and found the rolling pin that he was seen buying from the supermarket on the night of the attack. Following his arrest, Kochi Stellamaj was questioned by the detectives, but he wouldn't really say anything. He pretty much just responded to every question by saying no comment. But I mean, the police didn't really care. They had enough evidence to prove that he was the one who did this to Sabina, and so he was soon charged with her murder. And after he was charged, he made a very interesting comment to the detectives. A comment which I'm sure a lot of people would view as an admission of guilt in itself. He said to them, quote, what would happen if I open up now and say everything? And I don't actually know what was said after that, what the police responded to him. But as I said, that comment alone is almost a confession. It sounds like a confession anyway. But despite this comment, when it came to his plea hearing, he initially decided to plead not guilty to the crime. And it's believed that his defence were going to possibly go down the route of perhaps trying to prove that Kochi was in some way mentally ill. They weren't going to deny that he was the killer, but they were going to claim that he had some sort of mental disorder, which meant that he couldn't be held responsible for his actions and therefore it was manslaughter rather than murder, I suppose. However, this never ended up happening because, I mean, how could they possibly say that he couldn't stop himself and that he just lashed out when all of the evidence indicates that this crime was carefully planned and premeditated? I mean, it was a random attack on Sabina, but he planned it. He planned to attack a young woman that night. And so in February of 2022, he actually changed his plea to guilty. He probably realised that the evidence against him was overwhelming and that there was no way a jury would think that he was innocent. So might as well plead guilty in the hopes that this will earn him a slightly lower sentence. But despite pleading guilty to the murder, Kochi Selamaj was apparently adamant that the attack on Sabina Nessa was not sexually motivated. He claimed that attacking Sabina did not give him any kind of sexual gratification whatsoever. But of course, no one really believe that at all. Yes, he didn't rape her that night, but he did remove her tights and her underwear and pose her in a sexually degrading position. What other reason would he have for doing that, for leaving Sabina in that way, unless he got some sort of sick sexual pleasure from it? On the 8th of April 2022, seven months after Sabina's death, 36-year-old Kochi Salamaj was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 36 years. Years. So at the very earliest, he could become eligible for parole in 2057, by which point he will be around 72 years old. And something that made a lot of people very, very angry, including Sabina's family, was that Kochi Selimaj actually refused to attend his sentencing hearing. He just refused to leave his cell, which I mean, just shows you how much of a coward this man was. He clearly didn't want to have to sit and listen to 
to Sabina's family's victim impact statement to hear how much hurt and pain he had caused them and so he chose not to he just chose not to go and to be completely honest it makes me so angry that people like him murderers are even allowed that choice i'm sure a lot of you are aware that there was a lot of outrage in the uk just earlier this year from the public when child serial killer lucy letby refused to attend her sentencing hearing a lot of people felt that that just wasn't fair that killers like her and like coachy should have no choice but to attend and at sentencing and have to hear the families of the victims give their statements and I have to agree I personally think it should be 100% mandatory but it's not so. In the immediate aftermath of Sabina's murder news of the horrific crime spread quickly across London and just the entire country and as you can imagine people were absolutely outraged because Sabina was killed just six months after the horrific murder of Sarah Evans. Everard. And naturally, people drew connections between the two cases. They were both young women who were walking alone at night, something which they both had every right to do when they were murdered by a man. And when Sarah was killed, it sparked a huge nationwide uproar around violence towards women in the UK. So by the time Sabina was murdered, everyone was still in a state of shock over what had happened to Sarah. And now it had happened again. Now another that innocent young woman had been killed too. But with these awful murders came the realisation that these kinds of attacks were not uncommon. This fear that women felt and feel for their safety is not uncommon at all. This had been going on for decades and decades. But what was actually being done about it? What action was being taken to prevent women from feeling this anxiety? Like I said, women should not have to fear walking down the street alone at night. But we do. We shouldn't have to feel as though we have to constantly look over our shoulder or that we have to keep our keys in our hands ready to use as a weapon or that we have to stay on the phones to our friends or family whilst we are out alone just in case something happens. We shouldn't have to worry that we could be raped or killed by a stranger, by a man, if we decide to leave the house alone but we do. We live with that fear because of horrific cases like this and the chilling statistic that in the UK alone, a woman is murdered by a man once every three days. In the aftermath of Sarah and Sabina's murders, the public called for the epidemic of male violence towards women to be properly tackled by the government because not enough was being done. More measures needed to be put in place to protect women and also educate men, young men in particular, on these issues that women face in their day-to-day -day lives. Because it's not down to women to try and change the behaviour of men and women shouldn't have to change their behaviour or their actions to try and avoid being in a situation where something like this could happen to them. I have a quote here from Sabina's sister's victim impact statement, which was read out in court and which I think says it perfectly. They said, quote, our sister, Sabina Nessa, was more than just a sister, a daughter, a teacher. She was a life that mattered. A life that did not deserve to be taken in such a heinous and cowardly way. Everyone kept saying to us that she was in the wrong place at the wrong time, but she wasn't. She had every right to be walking down that path, all glammed up and going to enjoy herself after a long week of work. She had the right to feel safe. Following her death, vigils for Sabina were held in different cities across the UK to honour Sabina's life, one of which was in Pegler Square in Kidbrook, and literally hundreds of people turned up to pay their respects and show their support to Sabina's family. And Sabina's older sister, Jabina, spoke to the crowds of people during this vigil. She thanked them for coming along and showing their support, and she did a speech which is so emotional to watch. You can really feel the pain and anguish from her voice and her words. She said, we have lost an amazing, caring, beautiful sister who left this world far too early. She didn't reach her 29th birthday next month. Sabina loved her family. We have lost a sister. My parents have lost their daughter and my girls have lost such a brilliant and caring auntie who dearly loved them. Words cannot describe how we are feeling. It feels like we're stuck in a bad dream 
game and can't get out of it. Our world is shattered. We have simply lost the words. No family should have to go through what we are going through. My heart truly goes out to Sabina's family. It's absolutely horrific what happened to Sabina and devastating. She deserves so much more. As I said earlier on in the video, she had such a bright future ahead of her in all aspects of her life and it was cruelly taken away by an evil predator. But something positive which came out of this awful case is that many of the female students at the Greenwich University in London, the same university that Sabina went to previously to earn her sociology degree, they came together and decided to launch the Sabina Project which looks to spread awareness and start a discussion around violence against women and girls. As stated on their website, quote, our aims are to create open and healthy discussion around the pressing matter in hopes to educate society. And outside of the university, there is now a memorial garden for Sabina, which is so lovely and such a beautiful tribute to her. And that is it for this case. That concludes the case of Sabina Nessa. Like I said, a really devastating case. I actually found this case very difficult to research, to be honest, because it just makes me so angry and I feel just as angry now as I did back in 2021 when I heard the news that Sabina had been killed. But yeah, anyway, thank you so, so much for watching and for listening to Sabina's story. I hope I did her case justice. Feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye.